Do you know what happens when you burn a live body? The process takes longer than you think. It'll, it'll continue to burn, feeding on itself like a nub of wick on a candlestick. After a while, the body's natural defense mechanisms start to kick in. At the state of incineration, all blood and fluid delivery is shut off, attempting to limit the pain. But there's nowhere for all those materials to go. So they leave the body. A great, leaking faucet onto the ground. The carpet. The wood of the stage. The palm of your hand makes up about 1% of your entire body. This process, the expunging of fluids, begins when more than a quarter of the body is burned. Back in the day of witch trials, it would often take a few hours before the person would finally die. It took me one Google search to learn all that. I only guess that Emma Livery knows it too. I tried to figure out who could have left me the note, along with the Act 2 ticket, but so far, I haven't come to any concrete conclusions. However, after doing extensive research the day of the second performance, I have some new information and maybe one potential lead. Looking with fresh eyes after witnessing the atrocities that had taken place on the stage the previous night, I undoubtedly understood more than I had before about Madame Taglioni's ballet website. For one, those date ranges I saw under each Farfalla's headshot, I now knew what they were. Birth and death. The majority stopped at around 17 to 21, the same ages as most of the ballet dancers. Francisca Wilde was there, her picture taken before her disfigurement. The second year after her birth, left blank. Whatever happens in Act 2, it almost always kills Farfalla, which meant it would probably kill Emma too. Another thing I've learned, which I'm pretty sure many of you have already deduced, is what exactly happens to Farfalla at the end of the play. To put it simply... She set on fire. Farfalla, still stuck in her butterfly form, is attracted to the bright glow of a torch. As she dances nearer and nearer, her wings catch fire. And as she leaps and spins around the floor, she sheds her butterfly form and is turned back into a young woman. Or, in this case, she sheds her human skin and turns into a corpse. I'm getting more and more anxious. Time was slipping away too quickly, and I have no idea what I was going to do. It was afternoon at that point. Act 2, Emma's death. All only a few hours away. Whoever left my tickets, most likely both the first and second time, were someone who wanted me to stop this. I didn't know why they'd chosen me, or what exactly they had in mind as to what I should do. It seemed impossible to stand against something that everyone, Madame Taglioni, the dancers, the audience, all of them, seemed to be on board with. I felt alone, like I was the only one who could see the situation for what it was. But then, I found her. As it turns out, I'm not the first reporter to look into Madame Taglioni's ballet. There was someone else. A woman named Matilda Reed. She wrote for a paper in Augustus in the 90s, one that's since been shut down, which is probably why I couldn't find her in my preliminary search. On July of 1999, she wrote an article about Le Papillon. The paper didn't have a website, but it looked like someone had archived a photocopy on an amateur site about Augustus's history. The headline read, Madame Taglioni's Mystery Ballet. Not what it seems? Disappointed, the article didn't really go into anything new. It mostly speculated about things I already knew to be true. The hidden location of the performance, the violent nature of the dance, etc. But the article's contents hadn't been what caught my attention. Instead, it was the author's headshot at the bottom. Now, I had seen her before. I went back and checked to be sure. Although her last name had changed from Reed to Robertson, there was Matilda, 
the 32nd Farfalla of Madame Taglioni's ballet. I immediately started calling every number I could find, ballet studios, news outlets, anything in the area that might lead me to her, but no one had any information. She didn't seem to be anywhere in Augustus. I found a few more of her articles from the late 90s, most of which were about ballet and dance. She was a, an accomplished dancer, which I suppose she would have to be in order to make Farfalla. But her article tended to attempt to expose the darker side of the sport, abusive practice techniques, instructors that withheld food, dancers suffering injuries due to an unsafe performance environment. I couldn't find a direct number or address, although I knew she was alive, since the second spot in her year bracket in the ballet website was empty. She was Farfalla in 2002, three years after she had written the article about Le Papillon. Was it possible that she had gone undercover, or had she gotten sucked into the very madness that she wanted to expose? But then I remembered something. You know, in their 32nd year, they only made it part of the way through Act 1 because Prince Dalma's crown had caught on Farfalla's wing and ripped the whole thing off. The girl with the goldfish ring had told me offhandedly, but it, but it could be the key to everything. Unlike Matilda, the 32nd Prince Dalma wasn't nearly as difficult to find. His name was James Arden. He works as a dance instructor in Oregon. Like, but after being in Madame Taglioni's ballet, he had to get an entire country's distance away from him. I could feel my heartbeat in my ears as I dialed the number from the website. Arden's ballet instruction. How can I help you? Can I speak to James Arden? A pause. Speaking. I swallowed hard. Hello, Mr. Arden. This is, um, this is Samuel Singer. I waited in case there was any sort of recognition there, something to suggest that he had anything to do with what had happened. There was nothing. Good morning, Mr. Singer. Would you like to make an appointment? No, I said. Then after a deep breath. I wanted to speak to you about Le Papillon. I was surprised when James sighed. Look, I'm getting tired of these calls. I have no connection with Taglioni anymore. I can't get you an audition spot. I'm sorry. I interrupted. No, that's not. He pushed. There's plenty of good ballets. You kids don't need to get yourselves involved in- I wanted to talk about Matilda. There was a quiet on the other line. A few pulses passed as we both breathed into the receiver. Matilda Robertson? She was Farfalla in our show. Very talented. It was Kurt. and spoke as though he was thinking carefully about each word that he said. No, not Matilda Robertson, I said, equally as carefully. Matilda Reed. There was absolute silence. Are you still there? I asked. Who'd you say you were again? Sam Singer, I said quickly. Look, I just want to know where I can find her. It's important. I could hear him hesitating, not trusting me. I'm sorry, I don't know where she is. He paused. I wouldn't get involved with her, though, if you know what's good for you. Now, this piqued my interest. Oh? Why not? He paused. She convinced me to ruin the biggest performance of my life. And before I could say anything else, he spoke again. Look, that, that was 20 years ago. I don't want to rehash it. Good luck with whatever it is you're trying to do. Wait, I said suddenly, betraying the urgency in my voice. Please, someone's in danger, and I think Matilda might be the only one who could help. I had no idea if that was true. But it was my best lead yet, and I was running out of time. He waited for a long moment, so long I thought he might have hung up, until he let out a very heavy sigh. She's got a kid. A boy. I think he lives in the city. Ask him. Hey there, kids. Thank you so much for listening to tonight's story, and I wanted to tell you thank you, you know, for listening to me at all. I... I'm actually coming up on doing this for 10 whole years. Come January 4th, 
I will have been doing YouTube for 10 years. So that's a hell of a thing, man. And honestly, it means nothing without all of you. So thank you for that. Thank you for listening on YouTube or on the podcast. I also want to give a very big thank you shout out to all of you guys out there on Patreon. If you guys want to check out patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta, you're able to support the show, uh, support me, support my cats, support, you know, uh, being being cool folks out there like people like these. Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lenda Higuchi, Chumpinski, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kyle, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Raven Hart, 1-800-Nightmare, King Hades F-13, Unknown Nobody, Joshua McMeekin, Michael Scarborough, Kazen, this is my real name, no shit, Jason VB Wilson, Infernal One, Little Wolf Gaming, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Niels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Bradley Lipe, Ann Charon, Acid System, Mike Bollock, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for your support on Patreon, like I really can't thank you enough. Uh, and everybody who's down there in the description, thank you guys so much as well. And everybody who's not on either of those tiers, you just have a dollar on Patreon. I, I really, I can't thank you guys, like, for making these these past 10 years incredible this this entire time i've ever spent on youtube on podcasting everything amazing and all of you who are at home listening thank you guys so much for listening i hope you all have a wonderful happy holidays and sweet dreams <laughs>